Hello and welcome back. My name is Dr. Christopher Gennari and this is Great Big History Podcast. Thank you for joining us. In this episode, we're going to do the Cold War, 1945 to 1989, and a little bit after. A hard rains are going to fall, meaning nuclear rain. So, the U.S. and the USSR could not destroy each other in 1945. But nukes could destroy civilization. So war had to be fought by other means. War had to be fought by culture, by proxies, and by sports. So we're going to talk about how the Cold War happened without the U.S. and American and Soviet troops, Russian troops, shooting at each other. And what it meant. Well, we invented the nuclear bomb, the atomic bomb, in 1945. But by the 1950s, we have the hydrogen bomb. So the idea was, oh, in 1949, the Russians got, the Soviets got the bomb. Well, we'll make a better bomb, a bigger bomb. Well, they made one right quick after us. And it's much, the hydrogen bomb is much, much more powerful than the atomic bomb. So war meant the death of human civilization. You can't win a nuclear war. There, You can see movies in the early 50s or the late 40s where they talk about winning a nuclear war. They talk about, well, the bombs are f- falling, but we'll move to Iowa. It'll be fine. No. Following the hydrogen bomb, that's no longer an option. It will obliterate everything. And we get the policy called mad mutual assured destruction and it may have been a military accurate uh, uh, statement uh, mutually assured destruction but anti-nuclear people will quickly call it mad that was mad that you have thousands of nuclear bombs that will wipe out the entire earth that that's insane But the idea was, we have them, and they have them, so we won't use them. So what would happen if a nuclear weapon dropped on Philly? Well, the Tsar bomb is the largest bomb to ever be tested. It was tested in the 1960s. It's a Soviet bomb. It's known as the Tsar bomb. So if it was dropped on the Philly center... You would have 2.35 million deaths, 1.6 million injuries. Now you may go, well, why would more people be killed than injured? Well, because there's more people at the base of the middle of Philly. They would be incinerated. There'd be nothing left for them to be injured. That's the thing about a nuclear bomb. Unlike other bombs, it kills way more people than it injures initially. But it, but the Tsar bomb would have an unknown amount of cancers. You'd have no way of knowing how many cancers it caused in South Jersey, Eastern Pennsylvania, New York, Newark, Trenton. So let's look at, at the fireball. The fireball would eliminate. So the piece that you like think most about that big, like spout that goes up would destroy all of central Philly and most of northern Camden. Everything, everything would be knocked down or lit on fire. Now remember, most American houses are not made of brick or stone. They are made of wood. So they would immediately catch on fire. You'd have 100% fatalities in Collingswood and Gloucester, Gloucester City, as far east as, as Collingswood and Gloucester City. So, the Cold War takes on, especially from 1965 to 1989, competition by other means. We have the Kitchen Debate World Fair. At the World, the Kitchen Debate, the famous Kitchen Debate in the World Fair of 1959, which is Nixon, the Vice President of the United States, a significant figure, meeting with Khrushchev, who is the Premier of the Soviet Union, and they're taking a tour together. Oh! Isn't that nice? They're taking a tour together. And they get into a debate at the American kitchen. 
uh, exhibit because the American kitchen is full of all of this technology. Dishwashers. Um, washing machines. Dryers for your clothes. It's full of all of this stuff that makes life easier, especially for women to do homework, to do work at home, to do housekeeping, housework. I don't know what the correct word is to make stay at home moms, which is the typical role of a woman in 1959, more palpable, more easy. And having come to this, Nixon knows, ha ha, I know you don't have this stuff. So he says, look at our washing machines. Look at our self-cleaning ovens. Look at our ice makers in the refrigerator. Isn't this great? It makes life so much easier for our women. And Khrushchev, knowing he doesn't have any of that stuff, looks at it and goes, well, our women are too tough to need these washing machines to need all these machines to do stuff for them. Us Soviets have grit and we have spirit. You know, you might have technology, American superior technology, but Soviets have grit, hard work and spirit, which is funny. And that's why I have it up here for Rocky four, because Rocky four in 1984 is the complete opposite of that. How does Rocky train for his big fight with uh, Ivan Drago? How does he train? He goes to a hut in the middle of Siberia, in the middle of 10 foot tall snows. And what does he do? He picks up tires and he throws tree trunks and he like goes back to the land. He has no technology. It's him. He barely has shoes. Meanwhile, Ivan Drago is getting super vitamins injected into him. He's got uh, the monitoring of his heart rate and his oxygen levels and his electrolytes. He is the most scientifically analyzed human being on earth. And it's supposed to make, it's a, it's a movie of American grit and hard work versus Soviet uh, government technology, but the Soviets don't have any of that stuff. It's the exact opposite. The kitchen debate of 1959 is the exact opposite. It's the Americans who have the computers. It's the Americans who have the data. It's the Americans who have the special drugs. It's the Americans who are the advanced ones. The Soviets don't have any of that stuff. There's a space race. You invest in money and education and technology. And the idea was who's going to get to space first. And then once you got to space, it became, they changed the goalposts. Who's going to get to the moon first? But it was, you needed rockets and rocket fuel. You needed superior technology. And the USSR with Sputnik and Yuri Gagarin got there first. They had better rockets. They had more advanced technology in space. And so you get all this massive money. We have to catch up. We have to catch up. There's the missile gap. There's the space gap. There's the rocket gap. Cosmonauts were flying, were circling the earth, and Americans were still on the ground. But then Americans had Apollo 11, putting a man on the moon first. You have the Olympics, which is the competition of systems not people. Now, you may look at it and go, oh, there are people, but that's not how the countries looked at it. The professional training versus the amateur elite individual. We see this again in Rocky IV, right? The Soviet Union has professional training. Their Olympians are from kids, put into schools, put into programs, being trained, being supported, being subsidized to be Olympians. Meanwhile, in America, it's rich kids doing stuff that they want to do when they're kids. It's rich elite kids who can afford to go 
to the dance classes, the gymnastics, the swim pool when it's or when it's closed and to get them to open, you know, pay extra money to get them to open it just for you. No. So it's these different systems. So it was very important that the United States defeats the Soviet Union in 1980 in hockey because that's a bunch of amateurs. They are not professional hockey players. They are not yet in the NHL playing what is, for all intents and purposes, a professional Soviet team. So that's why it's called a miracle on ice. There's no way those guys were supposed to win. And they did. And so it wasn't just a win for those guys. It was a win for America. And you see it every time the Olympics are played. Do you believe in miracles? It's like the highlight of Americana. So why? Why do we have to do this stuff? Well, because in 1963, the Cuban Missile Crisis, also known as 13 Days in October, proved competition between the United States and the Soviet Union was too dangerous. There had been flare-ups ever since 1945. There was the, the building of the Berlin Wall. There was the um, split of West Germany and East Germany into two different countries in 1955. There was um, the Berlin Airlift. A lot of this happens because this is where the U.S. and the Soviet Union were closest in Germany, in Berlin, in, in post-1945. But the Cuban Missile Crisis, where Fidel Castro, having been, um, having defeated the, the Bay of Pigs invasion, which was sponsored by the United States and the CIA, went to the Soviets and said, protect me from these Americans. And the Soviets, knowing, Khrushchev knowing, that there were American missiles in Turkey, said, sure, I'll do that. I want them to feel how I feel. And when the American public found out, it was catastrophic. And for 13 days, everyone wondered whether they would live to see another day. And so what the Cuban Missile Crisis proved was American troops and Soviet troops can't fight each other. And so Right now, in 2022, we're dealing with a Russian invasion of Ukraine. And there are people who keep arguing, you have to make a no-fly zone. You have to put American troops to protect Ukrainians. You have to, you have to, you have to, you have to, you have to do more. And Joe Biden, who was a young man in 1963, wasn't a nobody. He was an adult, I think. I want to say he was an adult. 1972, well, maybe not. Maybe he's a teenager. I don't know when he was born. He's probably a teenager. But he knows that when American troops and, and Russian troops, Soviet troops, come close to shooting to each other, you could have a nuclear war. And that's bad for everybody. That's bad for civilization. It's bad for the earth. So how does the U.S. and the USSR fight each other then? Well, they do it through proxy wars. They have other people fight for them. So from the 1950s to 2010, you have the Arab-Israeli conflict. And within that conflict is the Palestinian conflict in the West Bank, whether it's 1948 and the Palestinians are ejected as refugees, or after 1968, the concept of a occupied West Bank, which is itself a complicated and a controversial topic. But from 1948 slash 1968 to today, the Palestinian conflict is part of this, right? The Palestine, the Israelis went to the United States and said, You're, we need you as our friend. We said, of course. And so the Palestinians and the Arabs went to the Soviet Union. In the 1960s, there's all of these African civil wars. In the 1970s, there's the South American dictatorships, the military dictatorships that we supported, the United States supported in order to stop another Castro from happening, another leftist pro-Soviet revolution from happening. So you get these military dictatorships, especially in in Brazil and in in Argentina, who also wage war on their own people. 
the liberals, the leftists, they, 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 they are as bad as Stalin. They spy on them, they arrest them, they make them disappear. And so there's the, in Argentina, I think is also in Brazil, but definitely in Argentina, there's the, the mothers of the disappeared. Oh, in Chile as well, there's the mothers of the disappeared. These mothers who are like, our sons were kidnapped in the middle of the night, and we don't know what happened to them. Answer, they were tortured, then they were shot, and then their bodies were dumped somewhere. But that's the United States. The United States supported conservative military dictatorships against liberal slash pro-communist um, progressive groups. Sometimes they're revolutionary, but not always. Uh, in Chile, they had actually won the election. And we supported uh, Pinochet's military coup against a democratically elected, a freely democratically elected government. We did the same thing in, in Iran in 1959, where we installed the Shah. It's either 54 or 59, where we installed the Shah. Which is why the Americans were the biggest enemy after the Shah was overthrown in 1979, because we were supporting him. Uh, in the 1960s till 1975, the U.S. was in Vietnam, and from 1979 to 1989, Amer Soviet troops were in Afghanistan. And so what you see in these proxy wars is a war on the periphery. It's not in the middle of Europe. It's in some, it's in the Central Africa, it's in Southeast Asia, it's in the southern tips of South America. It's not where, it's not in Europe. And the USSR and the USA flood the zone with weapons to support one side. And once they do that, the other side supports the other side. So in the African Civil Wars, you have a government going to the Soviet, uh, you have the colonial government, so let's say the Portuguese, going to the Americans and saying, we're allies, uh, give me weapons against these, these rebels. And so the Americans say, sure, okay, here's some weapons. Bombs, weapons, landmines, all kinds of stuff. Well, what do the rebels do? The rebels go to the Soviet Union and say, we'll be your friend, but help us overthrow the Portuguese. And the Soviet Union says, of course we'll help you, because if you overthrow the Portuguese, then Angola or Mozambique is now our friend, is now our ally. It's not an ally of the United States, it's an ally of the Soviet Union. And so they flood the zone with more weapons. And so what you get are these civil wars that just go on and go on and go on. This is what is starting to happen in the Ukraine. Well, actually, I shouldn't say that exactly. One thing that's looking like it's happening is what we ended with, the U.S. and Vietnam, the USSR and Afghanistan, where the USA and the Soviet Union use their own troops. But what did the other side do? Completely fund completely fund. We've given how many billions? A hundred billion dollars? Five hundred billion dollars? Worth of weapons to the Ukrainians? We are totally, Europe and the United States are totally flooding Ukraine with weapons in order for them to kill Russian soldiers. Now, we agreed somewhere in the past that that was okay. That's the way things are going to be run. That that's not an escalation. That we can do that. And the moment those weapons on a truck cross the border of Poland into Ukraine, the Soviets can bomb them. And if there's an American truck driver, that sucks to be him. This is why it was a big deal about the Ukrainians asking for um, so Soviet-era jet planes, MiGs, that are still in Eastern Europe. And Poland said, sure. Hey, America, give it to them. And we went, no, because that would be this escalation. It's not just giving like grenades to the Ukrainians. If you put an American, you fly a fighter jet into the Ukraine. That's different. I don't know why it's different, but it's clearly different. It just doesn't. So Soviet fighter jets did not fly into northern Vietnam. To help protect North Vietnam from the bombing. They did. Soviets did give anti-aircraft missiles to the North Vietnamese. 
And so American fighter pilots, including um, John McCain, got shot down by Russian missiles. But that was seen as fair game. It wasn't seen as an escalation. But that's also why the United States lost in Vietnam and the Soviet Union lost in Afghanistan because you couldn't expand the war. If you expanded the war to northwestern Pakistan or to northern Vietnam, things would get worse. It would get bigger and be more problematic. In Europe, it, there's a clear line between East and West. And the Soviet Union crushes the independence movements in Eastern Europe. Uh, see Hungary in 56 or Prague in 1968. And the U.S. also intervened in Western Europe to make sure that communist parties didn't win. Italian elections and French elections especially. Uh, very worried about the British elections in the 70s of, this, of the uh, Labour Party and the Socialists. Um, very happy. The United States was very happy. The United States government, I should say, was very happy when Margaret Thatcher was elected in 1979. And her and Ronald Reagan, who was elected the next year, got along famously as these, as these revolutionary conservatives. So they wanted to completely undo the New Deal system. And they did. The world I have grown up in, the world we live in now, is a world created by the low tax, low, low regulation, uh, broken welfare state of the Reagan Thatcher post New Deal, post 1980 world. With its massive inequality and its massive social problems and its massive businesses, that's the world they created. The one difference, the one difference between the British and the United States is the British healthcare system, which Margaret Thatcher wanted to get rid of, the NEH. But nobody in Britain wanted that. Like that was the bridge too far for the Brits. It was hard enough getting rid of the coal mines, which Given climate change, it turned out that was the right decision, even though it was economically horrible at the time, especially for the coal miners, but also for a lot of England. But the but the British so Labour parties, and then later the Conservative parties built the the national healthcare system in Britain. That is the most communist thing you will see anywhere in the Western world. The the Government pays the bills. The doctors work for the government. They are government employees. They are not independent doctors. They work for the government. The hospitals are owned by the government. And the Brits love it. It showed up in the uh, 2012 Olympics opening ceremony. I have never met a Brit who doesn't like the national health care system. They, 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 complain that it's, they, they complain that it's too slow or it's this or it's that. But you're like, oh, well, you should get rid of it and have an American system. And they will look at you like you're insane. So anyway, so what are the positive results? The positive results are more democracy. The U.S. says that the communist people don't have freedom and rights. So we will help you get freedom and rights. We will fight for freedom and rights, right? Ronald Reagan, Mr. Gorbachev, tear down this wall, right? Let the East Berliners out. Come to the West. Let them have freedom. Let them have democracy. Right? But also, the USSR, Khrushchev is pointing to black folk in the 60s and the 50s going, uh, you talk about freedom and human rights, and look how you're treating your black folk and your Spanish folk in the South. Black folk don't have any rights. They can't vote. So what does it mean? It means more rights for minorities. Both systems had to free up. Both systems had to allow more rights for minorities. And less violent oppression for non-Russians in the Soviet sphere. So no matter how conservative some of the governments are, they're never Stalin again. They can't be. Because every time they, they do things like keep Jews from migrating to Israel, 
boom, human rights be- gets gets uh, becomes a huge issue. I bring up Jewish migration because when I was a kid, that was huge. That the Soviet Union would not let Jews from Ukraine move to Israel. They had to stay in the Soviet Union. And then it may have been Gorbachev, it may have been before him, but Gorbachev probably certainly did it, was allowed it to change, allowed them to move. And suddenly all these Russian Jews were going to Israel. And that's what we're talking about. Like, because you got criticized that, oh, your system is so great. Why do you treat your minorities like crap? Which both systems did. You know, both systems treated their minorities terribly. Second is trauma. Terrible results. These are terrible results. It's trauma. Adults had to serve in the military. So the people of the generation before me were all in the military. And I, as a kid growing up in the post-Vietnam War era, used to see shrines in, like, friends' parents' basements that had these little rooms that were just, like, their military, had their, had their uniform up on the wall, had their flag, had their guns, sometimes the guns, uh, had their, had their medals, had their pictures. Like, there were little shrines to their time in Vietnam. They all served. We have teachers who were of that generation. They were in the military. They were all in the military. They went to war in Korea, Vietnam, Afghanistan. It's Soviet kids going to war in Afghanistan. Kids had to prepare for nuclear annihilation. Grandkids never knew a world that wasn't about to end. TV shows, movies, constantly, re- music, as we'll talk about, constantly reminded me when I was growing up, the world is two, there's an Iron Maiden song, right? Two minutes till midnight. That the world was about to end. And then Chernobyl happened. And I remember Chernobyl happened. I remember watching it, being like, there's been a nuclear accident in the Soviet Union. It was a massive nuclear disaster, which could have poisoned the world. Nobody knew. Nobody knew how bad it was. And so the idea was one mistake, one F up by one person, which is in a lot of ways what Chernobyl was. It was an, it was the screw up by the manager and his crew. One mistake could mean annihilation. So we have a little picture, if you're watching the video, of the explosion that happened at the nuclear power plant at Chernobyl. And the reaction. So the, my favorite comics back in the day were Bloom County comics. And so, you know, they have a they have a nuclear guy coming wearing his hazmat uh, mask, going, uh, "Hey, we had a problem with the nuclear power plant. You know, uh, we had a problem with the core." And the teacher's like, "The core?" And he's like, "Oh yeah, it went disappeared right into the ground." And she's like, "Get out, get out!" It's like, "Oh, you should have seen it. it was like a big old glowing gopher." Then another character, Milo, goes to the animals and says, oh, we had a little problem with our human technology. We're really sorry. Could you not breathe until like Tuesday? Because of nuclear radiation. And they're like, oh, that's bad. Like, humans could destroy everything. And that's comics. That's making fun of. Like, that is gallows humor. You don't have that today. What about music and culture? Well, actually, it turned out to be pretty awesome. You get Dylan, you get The Clash, you get Lou Reed's album Berlin, which all spoke to the collective fears of the Cold War. Now, Berlin is not about nuclear war. It's about a couple in an abusive, drug-fueled relationship that ruin each other. But it's in that gray, depressive... (laughs) When I think of Berlin, I always think of rain. East, when I think of East Berlin, I always think of rain. And it's, it's just dripping with this oppression of trauma, of terror, of that the world just sucks and it's about to end. Look at Doctor Who. Doctor Who is a British TV show. It's been on for 50 years and it's 50 years of fighting the Cold War without war, without more war. The doctor doesn't carry a gun. He carries a screwdriver. 
And it's, it's, a, it's a show about England winning without having the fight. Because remember, even though England will have, Britain will have nuclear weapons, if they fight, they lose. They're going to get nuked. They're an island. They're small. And so, like we talked about with, um, or like we will talk about with James Bond, Doctor Who is a way for Britain to fight and win without having to actually fight, which would probably mean lose. And so, but you get, get these, get these, um, things standing in symbology, things standing in for other things. So you get the Daleks, which are the Nazis. They go around going exterminate, exterminate, exterminate. They want to murder everything. That's the Nazis. You have the Cybermen who are communists. They want to make everyone into a Cyberman. They want to make everyone the same. The master is the tyranny of the technocrat, of the technocratic dictator. The I alone can fix it. The guy who cares about the system, but not the people in the system. You know, the idea that to make an uh, kind of Stalinist in a way, but, um, but without the, the communist ideology, the idea of being that like to make an omelet, you have to break some eggs. Well, the master is totally fine with breaking a whole lot of eggs who are people in order to make his omelet, his better world where he gets to run the show. So he's a technocratic dictator who thinks he knows best. The doctor himself is traumatized by the genocide destruction of his homeland. The dreams, and he just dreams, he dreams of being a traveler, showing his companions the cool stuff of the universe. But he keeps having to fight to save democracy, to save Western values. He doesn't want to fight. He has to fight because there's enemies of democracy constantly out there. There's the movies, especially of the 1980s, the day after. It was a TV show, which was in 1983. It's what life is like after a nuclear war. It's terrible. It's awful. It actually is one of the reasons we ended up with the arms treaties during the 1980s between Reagan and Gorbachev. Because people were like, oh, we can't have this. We don't want nuclear war. So I always laugh when I, when I talk to boomers who are like, when I was a kid, we had to hide under desks. You kids. And I'm like, I did too. <laughs> Not you kids didn't. I did. I did in the 1980s. Ronald Reagan came home from Iceland and said, we're going to bomb the Soviet Union. And people lost their minds because they were about to nuke. I lived on the outskirts of New York City. Right. And I asked my father, what are we going to do if the nuclear war happens? Like, can you imagine asking your parents what's going to happen when the end of the world happens? And he says, we're going to go to the roof and watch because there's nowhere to go. There's nowhere to flee. The highways will be filled with people. You, you, there's nowhere too close. There's nothing you could do. We're going to watch it. <laughs> then there's a series of TV and movies. The Dr. Strangelove in 1964. Star Trek's episode, The Taste for Armageddon in 1967. War Games in 1983, which was nuclear war is insane. But computers might just do it. We see this in the Terminator in 1984 or the Matrix in 1999 where the computers decide, why don't we just launch new nuclear weapons and murder everybody and then we could take over? Then the machines can run the show. And there's this idea that technology, especially artificial intelligence, especially AI, is dangerous and it's getting out of control. It starts with Dr. Strangelove, where it's an automated process that ends the world. You launch one missile, the other side has to launch all of their missiles, then you have to launch all of your missiles. And so you end, so the computers are, are already doing this. That's war games in 1983, that the technology is getting out of humanity's control, that there's no one to stop it once the wheels start turning. What about Europe? How does Europe feel about this? We keep talking about the United States and USSR, but Europe has an opinion about it too because they're going to be nuked. They're right in the middle. So we talked about Dr. Strangelove, but there's also Genesis. They're from their album Invisible Touch, the, the song Land of Confusion in 1986. The idea is that Europe is in trouble. We see this with The Clash and several other bands um, 
is it Last Day in May was a band I knew. It's a small English band I knew in the 90s, in the 80s. Um, was that Europe was in trouble. The USSR, the Soviet Union and the US are crazy. So here from, from the song, there are too many men, too many people making too many problems and not much love to go around. Can't you see we're in a land of confusion? And these are the world, this is the world we live in. These are the hands we're given. Use them and let's start trying to make this place a, a place worth living in. Oh, Superman, where are you now? Where everything's gone wrong somehow. The men of steel, right? That's Superman, which is American, but also steel is Stalin, Soviet. Men of power are losing control by the hour. The video for Land of Confusion is a puppet is a is a puppet show done by a comedy group in, in that was big in in Britain on TV in the 1980s and it was a political comedy group think of like SNL using puppets that kind of look like caricatures of major figures and it has Ronald Reagan nuking the world nuking the world at the end and it plays him as like a, a child with his little teddy bear he's an old like I know Republicans today talk about how Joe Biden might be senile and he's old. That's how people thought of Ronald Reagan. Like, it's funny that we've come in my lifetime all the way back that it was that this guy's too old to be in charge of nuclear weapons. It's insane. And so the comedy is him holding a teddy bear. You know, the land of confusion. Reagan nukes the world. He nukes Europe and then laughs about it. So, by the 1980s, the USSR economic system was no longer paying for itself. Gorbachev attempted to liberalize the economics and liberalize the politics. And what that led to was protests. What that led to was a collapse of the entire system. As people demanded the vote for other parties, the Soviet Union broke up its European empire in 1989, giving up and occupying Germany and Poland and Czechoslovakia. And then in 1991, it gave up its control out of the 15 republics that made up the Soviet Union. And so you get Russia, but without its empire. And this is a trauma for anybody who believed in the Soviet system or the Russian national power that goes back to the 1650s. You can make an argument it goes back even earlier but um, Russia invading and conquering much of the Ukraine and Belarus and Poland goes back to the 1650s, my period. And this led, this trauma led to the rise of Putin, this, this weakness of state, this weakness of economics, this trauma of the end of the Soviet Union, of the end of the Soviet system led to the rise of Putin promising to restore the economy and to restore Russian world power, to be taken seriously again. And he did. For 20 years, he has run the Soviet Union as a kleptocrat, stealing lots of money from Russia, but he has been fairly popular, especially with older Russians who remember the way the Soviet Union was and didn't like the shock treatment of capitalism, didn't like the kleptocracy of all of their stuff that used to be collectively owned, now being owned by mafioso uh, oligarchs who fled to Europe, stealing everything they could. The end of the Cold War was a humiliation for Russia, and it was a trauma for Eastern Europeans. East Germany flat out disappeared. It got absorbed by West Germany. So the question is, who are we in Germany? Angela Merkel is an Eastern German. And yet, the East Germany was poor. It's more rural. It's more polluted. West Germany had to spend billions of dollars to unify the country. And so there's this resentment in, in Germany, even today, of the Auslanders, of the, of the Easterners. Are there civil wars in Yugoslavia as ethnic tensions erupt into new countries? Serbia, Croatia, Bosnia-Herzegovina. Um, 
In Europe, it's the idea we're free of the Soviet Union, but will Russia ever let us go? That's the Baltic states. That's Ukraine. I wrote this lecture before the invasion, and here we are, the Baltic states and Ukraine, worried about being invaded. And then there's the great question, especially in Western Europe, of was the Cold War worth it? What was the damage to those who lived through it? And there was damage. I'm proof of that. My parents are proof of that. All the, all the boomers are proof of that. Our system is proof of that. The fact we spend $800 billion on weapons is proof of that. We spend, the United States spends more than the next 10 countries combined. Why? Who's invading America? Who? You don't need to spend $800 billion to stop terrorists. You just don't. You don't need, you don't need 12 or, or 20 aircraft carriers. Who's invading? Canada? So, what's the damage? Remember, we are spending $800 billion a year on the military, on defense, right? $60 billion, 60 would give everybody two years of community college education. Would get everybody in America an associate's degree. It's $60 billion a year to fund community colleges for free. We could have free health care. The rest of the industrialized world does. We don't. We could have free college, at least free community college. We could have free state four-year college too because we used to with the GI Bill. We don't. We have guns and guns and bombs. We make that choice. Why? Because of the trauma of the, of the Cold War. Because nobody knows how not to do that anymore. We see this in the song by Rush called Heresy in 1991. The Cold War was a waste of time, lives, money, energy. People died in the Cold War. I, I am always fascinated by what I see on YouTube of like Soviet military, like secret bombs going off, right? Secret, secret nuclear tests. And I'm like, some spy, some American spy died trying to get that film out of the Soviet Union in 1964. And now it's on YouTube. And it's got 3,000 views. Nobody cares. And yet there are stars in the CIA headquarters of spies, nameless spies, who will never be known, who died trying to get secrets out during the Cold War that now we don't care about. The counter-revolution, people smiling through their tears, who can give them back their lives and all those wasted years? All around a dull grade world of ideology, people storm the marketplace and buy up fantasy. The counter-revolution at the counter of the store, people buy the things they want and borrow for a little more. Do we have to be forgiving at last? What else can we do? Do we have to say goodbye to the past? Yes, I guess we do. All around this great big world, all the crap we had to take, bombs and basement fallout shelters. And I've had to be in them. We've had fallout shelters, fallout drills where I had to go to the basement of the elementary school. All our lives at stake, the bloody revolution, all the warheads in its wake, all the fear and suffering, all a big mistake. All those wasted years, all those precious wasted years. Who will pay? The answer is nobody. Nobody will pay. It was 50 years of war. 58,000 mostly young men killed in Vietnam. 38 or 40,000 killed in Korea. For what? For what? Vietnam's united. The Soviet Union doesn't exist. For what? And that's the great question is now that the Cold War is over, what did it mean? And we're still trying to figure that out. Okay, one of the most 
famous books that came out. I don't know how important it was because now it's laughed at, but I don't, I don't think it should be laughed at. I did a report on it in graduate school and got laughed at at the time, but is this book by Francis Fukuyama, who's a fairly conservative guy, called The End of History. And his idea was democratic capitalism won. Democratic capitalism won. That was the system that people wanted. What else is there? There's a couple military dictatorships, but they suck. There's communist China, which isn't doing all that great. I mean, it's not bad, but it's China's poor. China's not, you know. There's North Korea's dictatorship, which is a gigantic mess. So what other system is there? So the idea would be everyone would eventually become democratic capitalists. Everyone would be integrated into the world trading organization. Everyone would eventually have more elections and become freer as they became richer. Women would get more rights. Minorities would get more rights. Fascism had lost. Goodbye to the racist militarism. Goodbye to genocide. Communism had lost. Marxism still had appeals to people. But Soviet-style communism, done. Goodbye to the one-party state dictatorship. The idea was dictators will go away, and we saw them. We saw them go away in the 90s. We saw them have to open up their economies. Now, there are some places that didn't because they had a lot of oil. That's a big one. Um, but the world, the idea of this book was the world would be somewhere between Scandinavian redistributive socialism, a center-left, left kind of government, or American stock private market capitalism, the center-right. And that massive social development, social changes would come to an end. You would get no more American, French, Russian revolutions because you'd have more democracy. You'd have more freedom. That everyone would live in a world that was essentially the European, Anglo, democratic, capitalist system. You know, European, Anglo, Japan system. Australia, New Zealand. Like, that, that, that's how it would work. And so there were kinks in the system, but uh, we were moving towards that. And now it's brought up and it's a punchline. It's like, ha, 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 Francis Fukuyama was an idiot. He thought that everything would be great. But I, I always look at it as, I always look at it as, that was the optimism of 1997. The world was getting richer. The world was getting better. The world was getting more feminist, less misogynist, more democratic. The United States had a, had a budget surplus. We were paying down our debt. People were living longer. That there was an optimism of 1992 to 1998-99. You know, that the biggest scandal was the, the United States president had a sexual affair with a woman that wasn't his wife. And what did most Americans do? They reelected him. They didn't care. They went, ah, whatever. Things are fine. And I think that that should be the story of this book. That there was optimism that the world was getting better. Now, what Francis Fukuyama didn't see, and what few people could have seen, was the violence and continuation of militant Islam. See, after after the Soviet Union, a lot of there's there's not a lot of support for a lot of these terrorist organizations. They don't get the state support that they had before. But militant Islam continues and a lot of it is funded by very wealthy guys on oil oil money and it starts up in the 1970s and it's trying to remake the middle east it's trying to kick american corporations it's trying to kick western countries out it's trying to kick out their proxies the dictators hussein mubarak and assad who 
took over when the Europeans left in the 1950s, 1960s, 1970s. So militant Islam is still there. It's still going. Two, and this is probably the bigger miss, was the ability of the Communist Party in China to maintain power while giving Chinese financial success. 800 million people were raised out of poverty. 800 million. And there's no democracy. Nobody in 1995 would have said that. Everybody would have said, like the Soviet Union, if you make people wealthier, they will want more democracy. That's the history of Europe. That's the history of America. The richer people get, the more rights they demand. If you take my 101 course, we have talked about that ever since the Greeks. The richer people get, the more rights they want. That's not true in China. Now, I've talked to Chinese history experts, and I go, why? Why is not that true? And their answer has been trauma. The trauma of the failures, of the poverty, of the starvation, of the turmoil of the Great Leap Forward and the Cultural Revolution. That the older people don't want democracy right now. Maybe the younger kids will. But they remember catastrophe. And so they just want a nice, quiet life where they make more money. And if the idea is, I can't say anything bad about the CCP on Weibo, that's fine. That's fine. You know, live and let live, basically. C, the third thing is the success of white supremacy and neo-fascist movements in America and Europe. When I grew up, we called them neo-Nazis. We didn't call them the alt-right. No, we called them Nazis because they were Nazis. And the idea was, well, we were moving towards more diversity. We were moving towards more inclusion. You know, whether it was civil rights for black people and brown people, gay rights, female rights, there was more of it. More people were being included in Europe and in America. And what happened was... That neo-fascism got stronger as demographics changed. I remember being a kid and them and the news saying, by 2040, half the country will speak Spanish. And you could look at that as great. That's diversity. You could also look at it as that's white people disappearing, and I don't want that to happen. We're being taken over, we're being assimilated, we're being we're in the flood. And so there's a movement in America that is white supremacy. They, you know, white supremacists blew up federal buildings in Oklahoma in 1993. That the biggest terrorists in America aren't Muslims. They are white men. Nobody could see that. And so what we end up with 9-11. What we end up with is... The tiki torches in Charlottesville. What we end up with is China. And the Uyghurs. And concentration camps. And an economy we can't break up with. And who can't break up with us. And so the Cold War is a traumatic, despite not being boom, boom, shoot, 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 shoot. It's a traumatic experience for both Europe, for both the Soviet Union, for both the United States. So I'm ending with puppies. As Keanu Reeves says, puppies! Thank you. And I'm sorry. And look at our puppies. Our happy puppies. Take care.